Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here on this fall day. When I became Secretary of Health, I, would, I was often asked about the area of public health that concerned me the most. And I frequently answered that what would keep me up at night would be the risk of a global pandemic. In 2020, those worst fears have been realized, and that has come to bear. As you well know, and as I'll be talking about in a press briefing this afternoon, our cases are currently at the highest that they have been throughout the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged all aspects of our public health response in Pennsylvania and nationally. However, at the same time, we have seen many partnerships that have assisted and benefited Pennsylvanians during these extremely difficult times. These have included our testing partnership with AMI, who has and is currently conducting testing in counties across the state. It has included partnerships with private businesses who have stepped up and provided PPE, which in turn has been provided to hospitals, to long-term care facilities and other health care providers, counties, and first responders. More specifically, a number of these partnerships have assisted long-term care living facilities and our most vulnerable Pennsylvanians. We know that the number of cases of COVID-19 in a long-term care living facility is directly reflective of what is occurring in the community and county where it is located. So as we see case counts rising in all areas of Pennsylvania, it does lead to more cases in long-term care facilities. In addition, a COVID-19 outbreak in a long-term care facility, it's important to understand this, is not an indicator of a failure on the part of the facility. Because we know that in many, if not most cases, the virus comes into the facility through the brave and courageous employees who are asymptomatic and it's the same employees who are working tirelessly to assist those in long-term care facilities, but unwittingly they bring the virus into the facility. So we have testing requirements for these facilities as mandated by CMS. And our partnership with General Healthcare Resources or GHR has assisted in staffing for many long-term care facilities across the state. We have a great partnership with CVS Omnicare and we have the Regional Response Healthcare Collaborative Program, or the RIC program, and that has worked to allow free universal testing in long-term care facilities, all nursing homes, personal care homes, assisted living facilities, intermediate care facilities, and they were all completed by the deadlines that we set for them. These entities continue to assist with testing in facilities today as we work to prevent exposure in facilities and work to prevent the spread of cases inside facilities. The RICs have provided emergency staffing, rapid response, PPE, fit testing, a 24-7 call line, and more and more. Today, what I would like to focus on is the role of the Pennsylvania National Guard. On the day after Veterans Day, we all would like to thank everyone in our military and the National Guard for their service and sacrifice to our country and our state. The Pennsylvania National Guard has been absolutely vital to our response to COVID-19. I cannot express this strongly enough. Through the end of September, members of the Pennsylvania National Guard have served the equivalent of 7,351 days in the COVID-19 response. That is more than 350,000 hours of assistance that the Pennsylvania National Guard has provided during COVID-19. This has included work in planning and administration as members of the Pennsylvania National Guard are working tirelessly right here at Pima to assist in the response. It includes work transporting personal protective equipment and materials to locations that are in need. Among their activities, they have gone into long-term care facilities that have been dealing with staffing shortages and have provided essential assistance. This assistance 
has ensured that our loved ones in these facilities continue to receive the care that they need and they deserve. Some of this assistance has been in the form of nursing support and health care assistance. Some has been providing support services such as serving meals, cleaning, other tasks. This support has included performing infection control training, which is essential, and conducting COVID-19 testing in the facilities. All of these activities have been essential in ensuring that the residents of long-term care facilities have been cared for. These men and women in the National Guard deserve our unwavering thanks for the work that they have done and they continue to do right now. While their work during the pandemic may be different than previous deployments of the Pennsylvania National Guard, they have saved Pennsylvanians' lives, just as in their other missions. To further illustrate the vital importance of the National Guard's work in the long-term care facilities, I'd like to share the following comments. And these are from Jeffrey Black, Chief Business Officer with Grove Manor Corporation. Grove Manor is one of the facilities that has received assistance from the Pennsylvania National Guard. Mr. Black could not attend in person due to his company's COVID-19 travel protocols, but we wanted to share the following message. Quote, unquote. The Grove Manor Corporation is honored to be able to speak about the value and trusted capability that we have experienced with the Pennsylvania National Guard during the COVID-19 pandemic. Grove Manor, a skilled nursing facility located in Grove City, Pennsylvania, had the sad experience of an outbreak in early September. Like many facilities in the Commonwealth, crisis mode kicks in and evaluations are made to find ways to stop the spread. What we found with assistance in the direction of the RIC was that we did everything right leading up to the outbreak. So our issue was directed more towards staffing and direct care for residents. By September 11, 2020, we had 15 staff that tested positive with resident numbers increasing rapidly. The RIC helped us prioritize our needs and offered the most serious to the smallest support. The Pennsylvania National Guard working with the RIC, the Regional Collaborative Program, came to our building like a wave of energy and delivered positive professional hands-on support and help. Without their hand and glove approach to support and team building leadership, Grove Manor would have had serious issues providing the needed direct resident care. We had the guard working side by side with direct care staff helping our most vulnerable residents. We saw the guard delivering meals prepared in our kitchen we had the guard visiting with residents and keeping their spirits up. We saw the guard assisting staff with garbage. We had the guard providing licensed clinical care to residents. We saw the guard spending time supporting all of the staff in their daily, daily functions in their department. We had the guard encouraging our leadership and staff. We saw the guard providing loving and caring support to every person they encountered at Grove Manor. To say that we were blessed would be a significant understatement. The Pennsylvania National Guard performed a seamless transition of care and support even before they walked into the building. Dr. Fogel was in constant communication with building leadership to make sure all needs were being met to the highest standard. Simply stated, the Pennsylvania National Guard was a godsend. All of us at Grove Manor are thankful that we did not have to experience this crisis without the support of the Pennsylvania National Guard. Truly the finest, the best, and the kindest. They helped us save lives and control the spread of COVID-19. For that, we will be grateful for their service and their sacrifice. And it's starting to rain. All right, I'm supposed to go faster, okay. To date, all of this was made possible because of the federal government to prove Title 32 authorization, which has allowed state National Guard members to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in their communities. There are approximately 250 Pennsylvania National Guard members 
who are protecting Pennsylvanians as part of this authorization. And it's critical that this continue. So I would like to finish now, and I'd like to introduce Representative Chrissy Houlihan. Representative Houlihan is an Air Force veteran, an engineer, an entrepreneur, an educated, and a nonprofit leader. She's in her coming on second term, representing Pennsylvania's sixth congressional district. We're very pleased that you're able to join us today, Congresswoman Houlihan. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> thank you, Secretary Levine. And I'd like to take a moment on behalf of all of Pennsylvanians to thank you, Madam Secretary, for your tireless efforts and commitment to protecting Pennsylvanians throughout this pandemic. You have been a force. Thank you all for being here. As Secretary Levine mentioned, my name is Chrissy Houlihan, and I serve my community and the United States Congress. And it is very fitting, as she mentioned, to be here today, one day after Veterans Day. I myself am an Air Force veteran, an engineer who worked on the anti-ballistic de missile defense programming, but I also come from a family of veterans. Both my father and grandfather were career naval officers, and I have several active duty cousins to this day. In my family, we were never really big on anniversaries, something that's so important cannot or should not be relegated to a single day. And we have to honor our commitment in both words and our actions to our nation's service members and veterans and the Pennsylvania Guard is no exception. Our Pennsylvania National Guard has been on the front lines of this pandemic. They have been helping to save countless lives in our Commonwealth. And as much as we would like to believe that this is over, we are still very much in the midst of this pandemic. As Dr. Levine said, cases are going up, not only here in our Commonwealth, but across the country at record rates. Hospitals are overcrowded. This public health crisis and it is a crisis, continues to impact our, our economy and particularly our small businesses. I have spoken with countless small business owners in our community and I've heard their stories of struggle as they also work tirelessly to stay afloat. I say this all to impress upon anyone listening the severity of this pandemic and the bravery of our Pennsylvania National Guard that they have demonstrated over these past several months. I thank each and every one of you for your service to our Commonwealth. Now it is our duty as elected officials to ensure that those who are brave enough to answer that call to serve have the resources and support that they need. That's the deal. When I raised my hand to serve in the Air Force, I did so knowing that my country had my back. And right now, our Pennsylvania Guard needs to know that we have theirs. Currently, that support is tied to the administration's approval of Title 32 authorization. In Congress, I have joined a bipartisan coalition who is urging the administration to not only extend Title 32 authorization, but also to do so uniformly across the entire nation. My colleagues and I have been frankly perplexed by the president's decision to treat states differently by shifting some 25% cost share for some and maintaining full funding to others. States and commonwealths too are on the front lines of the COVID-19 response. And due to the additional cost and lost revenues caused by COVID-19, state and local governments are facing unprecedented pressures on their budgets. As we work to combat this pandemic, to reopen our economy, to get our kids back in schools, this is the wrong time to unnecessarily burden states with additional costs. Not only will this cost sharing take away state resources from other COVID-19 response efforts, but it also has the potential to lead to a reduction in our National Guard members supporting the COVID-19 response. The National Guard, as we've noted, has played an absolutely essential part in our COVID-19 response and recovery in all 50 states, in Washington, D.C., and in three territories. And they have served as a critical tool for states to utilize, their, utilize for their unique and changing needs. Here at home in Pennsylvania, our Guard has been used, as we heard, for a range of missions, such as supporting testing sites, assembling testing kits, conducting con contact tracing, staffing food banks, and as we've heard, assisting long-term care facilities. We here are just so very proud of the work that they are doing, and the federal government, myself included, should put its full support behind their dedication to serving our country. Republican and Democratic governors alike have asked for the extension of Title 32, a request that is supported by the Department of Defense, 
the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the National Guard Bureau. I strongly urge the administration to reconsider its decision to impose a 25% cost share on some states and to instead authorize a 100% federal funding for all states and territories under Title 32 until December 31st, 2020. Thank you to our Pennsylvania Guard for the sacrifices they have made in the fight against this pandemic. And thank you very much for having me today. And I will turn this back over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Houlihan. I'd now like to introduce my friend and colleague, Secretary Teresa Miller of the Department of Human Services. She'll be speaking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted long-term care facilities and the impact that the Pennsylvania National Guard has had on those facilities. Thank you, Secretary Miller. Good morning. And before I begin, I just want to thank the Congresswoman and all others in Pennsylvania who've served their country. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. I am really pleased to, to be here to talk about uh, this really important issue. I think everyone knows how dangerous COVID-19 can be in congregate care settings and residential care settings, particularly in those settings that serve those who are medically fragile or who have other health vulnerabilities that make them more likely to experience additional complications from COVID-19 as is often the case, as we know, of our long-term residents or our residents of our long-term care facilities. The Department of Human Services operates numerous state-run residential facilities, including four state centers that are home to people with intellectual disabilities. Residents of these four state centers tend to be older and they may have co-occurring chronic health needs. Our state center staff have done incredible work to keep the people that they serve safe during this public health crisis. In order to monitor the potential presence of COVID in these facilities, staff at these facilities were tested as part of the administration's universal testing order for long-term care facilities. The National Guard was called in to assist with testing for staff at the Ebensburg, Sealands Grove, and Whitehaven State Centers. This support allowed testing to be completed without interruptions to resident care. The Guard's efficient organization and professionalism made this testing work a success and provided support and recommendations to support the center's surveillance and testing processes once baseline testing was completed. Leadership at the Sealands Grove Center conveyed that every Pennsylvania National Guard member who worked with center staff during the testing effort displayed great compassion for the sensitivity and anxiety that people caring for vulnerable, medically fragile populations are experiencing throughout this crisis. The Guard eased concerns and fear around testing and their hands-on support made the universal baseline testing process a success for our state centers. On behalf of state center leadership and our staff and residents, I cannot thank the men and women of the Pennsylvania National Guard enough for how they are helping keep our staff and residents safe. Beyond their work to support our state-run facilities, the Guard has been invaluable to our licensed long-term care facilities experiencing large outbreaks who need additional staffing support. In the last eight months since COVID-19 first reached Pennsylvania, our knowledge of how to manage this virus has improved but outbreaks are still occurring, and this is still a great risk. We've established a system of support networks to assist long-term care facilities if they experience an outbreak. The ability to use the Pennsylvania National Guard as part of this response is a big part of this support network. We must continue to be able to utilize the Guard's support in the weeks and months ahead. Cases are surging in Pennsylvania, as we know, and around the country. We're headed into what will likely be a very challenging winter and flu season. Removing these resources as the threat becomes more acute will make Pennsylvania and other states less prepared to react nimbly to what's ahead. I urge the federal government and President Trump to remember their responsibility to protect Americans from this pandemic 
and reauthorize Title 32 so we don't lose the National Guard support. Thank you again for allowing me to join you today and I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Vogel for your leadership and to the men and women of the Pennsylvania National Guard for everything they are doing during this pandemic to support people in long-term care facilities. Thank you. And I will turn it back to Secretary Levine. Thank you, Secretary Miller. And now we will turn things over to my friend and colleague, Secretary of Aging, Robert Torres. The Department of Aging has been working throughout the pandemic to ensure that the voices of older adults living in long-term care facilities and their loved ones, as well as those at home, are, are heard and that the safety of older adults is protected. Secretary Torres. Thank you, Secretary Levine. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here on behalf of the Department of Aging to recognize the Pennsylvania National Guard and the important role that they've been playing in protecting older adults during this pandemic. The Department of Aging serves the needs of older adults living in long-term care in two ways. Our State Office of Long-Term Care Ombudsman advocates for residents, helps them to understand their rights, and ensures that they have a voice. Our Office of Protective Service investigates reports of suspected elder abuse and ensures that they are safe. Since the pandemic started, both of these offices have had to adopt new practices and navigate challenges in responding to residents' needs while ensuring everyone's safety. The Pennsylvania National Guard and the Regional Response Healthcare Collaborative Program, or RICP, have enabled our ombudsmen and protective service workers to continue their vital work. Indeed, the Commonwealth's regulatory entities and protection and advocacy groups would be unable to fulfill their roles and in fact would be overwhelmed by the public health needs of this important constituency if it weren't for the RICP and the Pennsylvania National Guard providing critical services. The presence of the National Guard reflects the seriousness of the Commonwealth's commitment and strategic engagement to fight the spread of the virus within the long-term care setting. This is a mission we're all on together for older adults, and the National Guard helps to elevate our, our efforts. As you have already heard, the National Guard serve vital roles both on the front lines providing health care support and behind the scenes preparing and distributing meals for residents, efficiently disinfecting surfaces, and labeling residents' personal belongings for safekeeping while the residents are temporarily moved around. They also assure that everyone that enters or exits COVID-positive environments do so with their PPE in check and properly worn. The engagement of the Pennsylvania National Guard is important because this pandemic is a real serious threat to our older adults and individuals with disabilities. And these, value, these vulnerable populations deserve to be protected and supported with resources like those offered by the women and men of the Pennsylvania National Guard. I commend the vital role they play in keeping long-term care residents safe and add my department's voice to the call to keep this vital support in place through the reauthorization of Title 32 funding. Thank you. Secretary Levine. Thank you, Secretary Torres. And now, now I would like to introduce someone that we've really worked very closely with during the entire pandemic. Since the pandemic began, um, myself and the Department of Health and our team have been working in the office space here at the Pima building so that we could coordinate closely the response to the pandemic. The work by the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency to assist in this response has been invaluable to the pandemic. And so now I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Director of Pima, Director Randy Padfield. And here comes the rain again, apparently. So, 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'm pleased here, or to be here today with my fellow colleagues from the other state agencies and Congresswoman Houlihan to discuss some of the great work that has been accomplished by the Pennsylvania National Guard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. At Pima, our primary role during disasters and other emergencies is to ensure there is coordination of response and recovery efforts across state agencies, the federal government, and other stakeholders that leverages the strengths of each agency to support those affected. One of the key principles during any response is to ensure unity of effort, which is critical in dealing with complex response and recovery operations. This allows us to bring the expertise of various groups together to solve what can be complex problems that arise during any response. The COVID-19 pandemic is different than other disasters and emergencies that we're more accustomed to dealing with in the fact that it's a public health emergency that requires specific public health expertise to effectively manage. This response is led at the federal level by the Department of Health and Human Services and at the state level by trained, experienced, and well-qualified staff in the Department of Health. However, throughout this pandemic, we have repeatedly seen impacts both within and outside the public health space that have required significant collaboration across state and federal partners to effectively manage, some of which you've heard here today. Our response plans at Pima are predicated on a number of support functions that may be needed to respond to any one of a number of disasters or other emergencies. These functions are usually primarily led by a specific state agency, but multiple state agencies and other stakeholders or groups may support the primary agency with carrying out specific functions. If you would review any of our plans, you would see that the National Guard shows up as a supporting agency to many of our primary support functions. This is because they have the staff with the knowledge, training, and expertise, as well as the equipment to provide a wide range of support functions, regardless of the nature or cause of the emergency. Their support is critical in just about any response and recovery operation that we may be faced with in the Commonwealth. And we are truly blessed to have such a qualified group of individuals serving our nation, as well as our state. The COVID-19 pandemic is no different in the fact that the National Guard has provided several key support functions throughout the pandemic. As you've heard with some of the other speakers, some of the examples include general transportation support for movement of commodities such as PPE and other supplies, support for mass feeding operations and food banks to ensure food security, fatality management support, support with community-based testing sites, support to build out alternate care sites throughout the state and obviously the ongoing support they've been providing to the long-term care facilities since the inception of the pandemic. The support that has been provided by the National Guard to combat these outbreaks in long-term care facilities, along with the other response elements, such as the Regional Response Healthcare Collaborative Program, or RICP program, cannot be overstated. It has been a critical part of a multi-layered approach to respond to what has undoubtedly been an extraordinary or extremely complex problem set. The solutions to these types of, of complex situations require bringing the expertise of multiple agencies together so that there is a well-coordinated approach and unity of effort across all involved in the response. The ultimate goal is to stop or significantly limit the virus spread in these facilities and protect the patients and healthcare workers. This ongoing support has been made possible through their activation under a specific status under Title 32 that activates them under federal orders and mission assignments while they are still under the control of the governor to direct their specific response priorities and functions. This status is critical for a number of reasons, since it enables more long-term missions and mission planning, provides greater benefits and coverages to the soldiers who are serving in support of their state, and enables the federal government to directly pay response costs fully or in part, thus lessening the financial burden on the state. This status was originally approved in the early stages of the pandemic and reauthorized in June, but is set to end in mid-December, if not reauthorized at the federal level. We have processed a request for reauthorization of Title 32, and as Congresswoman Houlihan has indicated, there are other states that are doing the same. To be able to maintain their status and are hopeful this request will be acted on in a timely manner to extend the status to the National Guard so they can continue their critical support for the missions regarding COVID-19. Again, I'm pleased here today, or to be here today with my colleagues to discuss our ongoing response efforts and to look forward to our continued work together to combat the COVID-19 pandemic 
throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Director Padfield. So now I'd like to introduce someone very special who is a member of the Pennsylvania National Guard and has been performing this vital work over the last number of months. Dr. Albert Vogel is a doctor of osteopathic medicine specializing in geriatric medicine. He is also a lieutenant colonel in the Pennsylvania National Guard, where he serves as brigade surgeon for the 2nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, as well as the Task Force West Medical Director for COVID-19 Response. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Vogel. My pleasure to be here today, and I accept all the compliments that have been given to the National Guard from all those attending, and I accept them in behalf of the soldiers that are currently right this minute working in nursing homes, transport transporting PPE, preparing meals, and in some cases doing direct physical care to our nursing home residents. I would say that this is a job the National Guard never expected to have. We have responded over the years to multiple times when the state has called us, when they've needed us for disaster relief, for flood, for snowfall, for trees down, for innumerable different things. But this has been a very special and different call to our citizen soldiers to respond. And I think the Guard is uniquely placed that we were able to bring on nurses, medics, and general purpose soldiers to meet the needs that this pandemic has caused to happen only by them responding. I have been in nursing homes where directors of nursing were literally stretched to the point of breaking when we walked in to be able to help them, replace some of their nurses, have our medics work side by side with their CNAs, have my general purpose soldiers go in, mop floors, pass out meals, sit with an aged person. As a geriatrician, it's truly my calling for older people. I've been involved in nursing homes my entire medical career. Before, when I, I was a doctor, I was a PA and a paramedic, and I've always had that calling. And I do believe without the, the Pennsylvania National Guard here, we could have been in really some dire straits. So it is incumbent on everyone to continue to support the mission that you've given us. And the only way to do that is to have our soldiers continue to be able to be in nursing homes, transporting PPE, and we can only do that with the appropriate funding. Our soldiers have been amazing in this area. They have been appreciated and thanked at every level that they've been there. And I can't tell you enough about what they've done. These are citizen soldiers who have sacrificed their citizen's life and their jobs to come into the Guard on the title that they can to be able to work They've left their families at home. They're working seven, eight, 10 days straight in nursing home, all shifts, working 11 to seven, working three to 11, sometimes doing over because they're needed. Our nursing homes are stretched. They need the help. I'm here to tell you, we have put in thousands of hours just in the last month and a half. I personally in the last week have done five site visits to nursing homes to assess their need for the guard to come in. So you can see that we are still in need of assistance and only by the states and the federal government giving us that backing can we continue. I really appreciate all your compliments. I say thank you from the private, to the captains, to the sergeants, from the nurses, from the medics, and the general's purpose soldiers who are out there today in nursing homes and will be there 24 hours a day serving our aged population, your mothers, your grandparents, and they're there for them. And we thank you for supporting us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Vogel. The importance of the work of the Pennsylvania National Guard during this pandemic in long-term care facilities and in other situations cannot be overstated. And it highlights how absolutely essential it is that the federal government provide Title 32 
for authorization. Thank you. And now we are pleased to answer questions. Yes. Could you be more specific about what would happen in Pennsylvania regarding the National Guard's efforts in long-term care, about what would happen if the legislation isn't authorized? I mean, is it a matter of, of things might have to actually cease, or is it a matter of it just makes the, a financial situation at the state level worse? So I want to, um, I'm going to let, um, uh, uh, Randy Padfield, Director Padfield answered, but I want to emphasize it's not legislation. This has to come from the executive branch. This has to come from the president. We're talking about titles. It's yes, I 32. understand, but it's yeah. not legislation. Okay. I believe I heard the question regarding what happens if Title 32 is not reauthorized. And specifically in terms of the impact it would have on the efforts in long-term care by the National Guard. You know, I'm trying to understand if, if, if this threatens like real limitations, um, or if it's more of a matter of we'll just have to find the money elsewhere within Pennsylvania. So there, there's a there's a couple of different concerns, obviously, with not reauthorizing Title 32. Number one is the financial consideration. Um, the financial consideration is, is one of the, the things, that obviously, more financial burden to the state to be able to maintain a National Guard status under what is considered state active duty is a concern. But also, under Title 32 status, where they're federalized, it provides for a much longer um, ability to be able to maintain their services. So, as uh, Colonel Fogel talked about, the state active duty was really designed for a very short duration situation, maybe a couple of weeks for responding to mostly natural disasters and things we've used the Guard for to be able to support in the past. The challenge is all of these Guard members are coming, especially folks with medical training, are coming from primary employers and they're employed a lot of times in the medical profession. So the challenge is being able to keep them for longer periods of time. Title 32 enables that. It gives them additional coverages that aren't available right now under state active duty. Um, so it's not that it would go away. We have plans in place to be able to maintain continuity in the long-term care facility. So just like anything else we do, we have a number of contingency plans and backup plans if it would not be reauthorized. However, the best mechanism to be able to keep them and engage them for longer periods of time and to be able to ensure their benefits and their pay and less financial burden to the state is the reauthorization of that Title 32 status. Is there any pending expiration date? There is. That, that date actually expires mid-December right now. I believe it's December 14th. There are some requirements that we need to take the folks that were actively involved in uh, direct patient care off of the kind of the response for 14 days prior. The reason being is if they were exposed to COVID, they have a quarantine period before they go back. So really we're looking at the beginning of December. So that's why it's really critical and that's why we're all here today to really talk about that, is that we need to be able to have time to execute alternative plans if we need to, but really the, the best thing to do is really extend that Title 32 status. And, and we're not um, unlike any other state. There are multiple other states that actually have National Guard committed to very similar missions to what we talk to here to varying degrees. So it really impacts the entire nation. Well, as I was speaking before, we are citizen soldiers. And so when we're called out to state active duty, our employers have known in the past that we may be gone for three, four, five, seven days to respond to a disaster. And so we're put on state active duty orders and that comes out of the state pot of money. This has been an ongoing and is going to be an ongoing pandemic. And we need the time to have our employers know that we're going to be out and for us to be on the title 32 orders then gives us different things to carry us on that time the employer will know we're going to be there our insurance can change from our employer and we can get tricare insurance 
that's another big issue. You, you can't get that on state active duty. You have to rely on your employer. So there's a lot of factors in there that in, involves different pots of money that can be accessed that we can't do at state active duty. And I will tell you right now, these nursing homes are stretched and we, we, we need to be there. Um, like I said, I did five in the last week and that's just in Western Pennsylvania. We, you know, there is a certain of awareness of what the National Guard did during the spring peak. It got a lot of coverage. What are the expectations? I mean, now that we're, we're in another peak, what are the expectations on the level of, uh, you know, involvement or effort there will be on the part of the National Guard in long-term care? Like, what's the expectation compared to the spring? I think the expectation is the same but it will all depend upon whether we get funding to be able to do it. The expectation is that we're going this is a long-term thing, just as we're in long-term care. We are not faced with just things ending next week or in mid-November. We have expectation that this is gonna continue. So our expectation as soldiers is, we'll do what we're called to duty, that's what we do. We serve the citizens and the Commonwealth and we wanna be there for them. Unfortunately, we can't do it for free. And there's gotta be a way to fund that. And the expectation is that this isn't gonna end. We've got a ways to go. So to be able to meet the need that we've had in the spring, we're having that need now again. And we wanna be there for it. And as they've explained to you, they need the funding. I, my soldiers need to be paid. And they need to be able to have health insurance so that their families can be taken care of. Does that give you a clear enough answer? If what you were able to give in the spring is going to be enough with what we're facing we now. We don't know. That's an unknown quantity. Good morning. Uh, is Pennsylvania one of the states that's not getting the full federal funding for this anymore? And how is that straining resources? Mm -hmm. And then separately, maybe you can handle this. Uh, Do you Director Padfield. Okay. All right, I think I understood the question is, are we getting full funding for it or not? So we're not. When it was originally authorized um, in the, the beginning part of the pandemic, uh, everything was authorized for 100% federal uh, reimbursement. So when it was reauthorized in June, there were, I believe, uh, probably three or four states that were reauthorized for 100% federal share. So the, the costs were going to be picked up 100% by the federal government and the remaining states were covered under a 25% uh, cost share. So they actually had to provide 25% of the cost and 75% was reimbursed by the federal government. Uh, since then, there were some other states that may have been added in that. Uh, if you look at that uh, reauthorization, they were usually the states that had significant outbreaks at that time. Uh, so since June up until this point, we have been reauthorized with a 25% cost share at this point. Strained resources or affected what? Is that strained resources or affected what can be done? Uh, it has not strained resources at all. It just requires that we have the ability to be able to co cover 25% of the costs, and there are various ways to be able to do that. So one of the ways we can use is uh, CARES Act funding to be able to to provide that cost share. Um, so the the challenge is that's 25% of the CARES Act funding that doesn't get potentially used for other things. So it becomes more of a financial burden for the state. Um, and that's a discussion that occurs on how that 25% cost share is going to be, you know, uh, taken care of. And then, that I don't know the detail on this, but what part of the federal government or who in the federal government ultimately makes that decision to fund at 100%? Ultimately, it's the president of the United States. This is certainly a question for the Trump administration then, but I'll also ask you, has 
Have we reached out to them recently and what has their response been? How are you characterizing the relationship or the conversation with them? So we've reached out through multiple avenues. We work through obviously National Guard and our FEMA Region 3 partners in Philadelphia. Uh, we've actually done a number of things to be able to request that. So there's been an official letter that has been sent. We've also requested through a mission authorization process the extension uh, and we have not heard back to date on whether uh, that is being considered at this point in time or not. Yeah. Uh, Secretary Levine, I have a question for you. So one of the things that you said was that what's happening in the nursing homes, at least in terms of spread, is mirroring what you're seeing in communities. When I spoke with Franklin County two days ago, they, they said that exact same thing. So I guess the question is, is there more of a focus then on the nursing homes than the general community and I mean, how, how does, how, where's the correlation? Because if you're seeing the spread in the community at the rate we're seeing it in say Franklin County where we have a 12.4% positivity rate, how do you keep it out of the nursing home? Well, so uh, this has been true since the beginning of the pandemic is that as we've been saying, the rate of uh, COVID-19 or the prevalence of COVID-19 in these facilities is directly proportional to the prevalence in the communities where they are. And that's because, I mean, people, uh, employees, prim primarily uh, brave, courageous employees who are coming to work in those facilities every day, uh, we know that they can have asymptomatic COVID-19 and bring it into the facility unbeknownst to them. Um, uh, our, our um, plan to deal with that is uh, the, the testing. So we had done, as Secretary Miller pointed out, universal testing in all of the facilities that the um, Department of Health regulates, as well as the Department of Human Services. There are re-testing protocols in place as well of staff and of the and of the residents. So we're trying to pick up the asymptomatic uh, people who might, who might spread it. Um, and the way we're coping with the risk is through the methods that we have talked about today. Um, the, uh, um, CVS Omnicare is doing much of that testing. Uh, we have um uh, we have the RIC program uh, with the regional collaborative program with fantastic academic medical centers that are uh, that are, are working in those facilities every day. Um, and we have GHR, our, uh, our um, uh, 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 program that we have hired to also go into facilities. Uh, and we have the guard. And so um, there is an increase in the amount of uh, a number of patients in facilities in, in nursing homes, nothing like we saw in the spring, but we have seen an increase, but we are working really hard to do everything we can possibly do to protect uh, our vulnerable uh, seniors in those facilities. Now, this is not just in Pennsylvania. Uh, every state in the country now see, uh, is seeing increases is having challenges in the long-term care facilities. I might add that the RIC program's funding ends at the end of this year. Year. And we need the CARES Act funding to be reauthorized uh, by Congress and signed by the, the president um, so that uh, then the legislature in Pennsylvania can reauthorize uh, the, the RIC program because you put together the guard and the RIC program, I mean, that is the framework of our response in the facilities. And so, Mike, I guess another question is, you know, I have family members and I know thousands, hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians have family members in long-term care facilities. What advice do you give to them if they're concerned about their health moving forward of their loved ones? Well, I, I think it's the, the same advice that, that, that we give for everyone. I mean, we are doing everything we can possibly do. I mean, I think the RIC program is actually a national model, engaging academic medical centers and their expertise uh, to go into the facilities. I think that should be replicated um, nationally because it's been so successful. Um, but I, I think that uh, what everyone needs to do is we need to stand united. We need to answer the call and everybody needs to wear a mask, wash their hands, social distance, avoid large gatherings, avoid small gatherings. I know it's going to be challenging, but this is not time the time to get together with seniors and with family over the holidays. It, uh, unfortunately, given the, the size and scope of this global pandemic, it is a time for us to, to be within our household, to uh, interact with our loved ones remotely. Um, and I think everybody shares a collective responsibility. We're all interconnected. And I think your, your question highlights this. What people can do is work within their household, within their community, and to help the Commonwealth to stop the spread. 
Just for, just for perspective, I mean, how many long-term care facilities has the National Guard been called in to help since the pandemic began? Is it like a couple dozen? Is it a hundred? Um, no. I don't have that exact. Do you know, doctor? We can get you that number. We can get the number, but I would estimate at least 150 just in the last six months. And as I said, I was just in doing five site surveys in the last week, just in Western Pennsylvania. So it's there and it's gonna be there. While we have you at the podium, um, you touched on the idea that soldiers might not be getting TRICARE and so forth when they're off Act 32. Are there other ways in which they are affected? For example, maybe they don't get a, I don't know if they get like a, a basic allowance for housing or if they have other additional parts of their compensation for their service, or even for example, future ability to uh, utilize, um, you know, GI Bill benefits and things like that are related to their status. That is all of those points that you're making are involved in the Title 32. The 502F orders they're under are totally different than state. State active duty is just for the short term. Therefore, those types of benefits were never included because we never expected state active duty to be more than just an emergency activation to respond to disasters. This is a long-term pandemic and it requires a long-term commitment. That long-term commitment is with the Title 32, which does give the soldiers added benefits that they're gonna give up in their personal private jobs. And that way they get them. Okay.